2 Kings chapter number 6, I want to preach a message to my church today in the days that we're living in that I feel like will be a help to you. 2 Kings chapter number 6. I'd like to begin reading, please, in my text in verse number 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver, is what the Bible says. Now look what it says after they give the prices of this. And as the king of Israel was passing upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor? You want more manure? Or out of the wine press? Do you want the dregs that were left over from wine in days gone by? What can I do for you? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And if you can believe this, this is what she answered. This woman said unto me, Give me my son that we may eat him today, and we'll, we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall. And the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elijah the son of Zaphath, shall stand on him this day. Thank you for reading with me. I want to preach on something that's very concerning with our church, with our families, and with our country. I'm hearing this statement more and more and more, even numerous times on a daily basis. It's not only a statement, it's a question. And it's a question that deserves an answer from your pastor. And the question is this, why is everything falling apart? I could not tell you the times in the last three months when I have heard so many people ask the same question that don't even know each other. Why is everything in this world falling apart? Under the leadership of Solomon's son Rehoboam and Jeroboam, which was a former officer of Solomon, the nation of Israel had split after Solomon's death. Rehoboam took the southern part of Israel and called it Judah. And the capital there was Jerusalem, and he was the king there 17 years. But Jeroboam, which was an officer under Solomon, took the northern kingdom, and he called it Israel. And Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. He was the first king of the northern kingdom, and he reigned there 22 years. So after they have divided the kingdom, and Israel is up north and Judah is down south, the Syrians decided to besiege or surround the capital of Israel, which was Samaria. And in that siege... They forbid any import or any export from coming into the capital of that country. Some commentators believe that this surrounding lasted up to seven years. So the Syrians had mounted numerous unnumbered supplies, was shipped into the front lines of their army, expecting a very long waiting period before Israel would ever surrender. It's amazing to me when the country was falling all to pieces, when people were needing help, when disaster was on every hand, out of everything the king could have said to the people, he said to them, I'm going to kill Elijah. Preachers get blamed for everything. They said the reason why we're besieged, the reason why there's no food, the reason why this country's in a mess, it's the preacher's fault. We've always been blamed for everything. Doesn't matter what's wrong with you, it's my fault, right? So they decided the best thing to do was to kill the preacher. If I were to walk you through the land of Samaria, it would be a very detrimental sight that you would see. 
I want to deal with three points on why everything is falling apart. And by the way, if you focus on a problem, I teach this when I preach on the home, I teach this at a church, and I teach this in the business world when I'm talking to young entrepreneurs. 75% of entrepreneurs fail. And I say to them this, if you have a problem and all you focus on is the problem, it's never going to get better. You can talk about it over and over and over. So what you do is you realize there's a problem and you focus on solutions. Because solutions can change the situation and take something negative and turn it into something positive. So if you get up every day and you're not happy with your marriage and all you want to talk about is how unhappy you are, it's never going to get any better. Find common ground in something positive that will make your marriage better. It's the same thing with the church. You think I'm going to waste my time getting up here every Sunday and talk about the people that left? Are you kidding me? There's a few more of you that need to hit the road. But I'm not wasting God's time and mine talking about people that's not even here anymore. I'm not throwing bread to goats. I'm going to feed the sheep when they come to the house of God. I'm going to focus on you. So I want you to notice, if you know anything about society and you talk to anybody, everybody's negative. I hate to see people coming in the door because somebody's complaining about something, but nobody is offering a solution. Today, we know everything is a mess. We understand everything is falling apart like never recorded before in history. But I want to give you a solution to this. How do we fix this mess that we're in? Because then we can have some productivity in our life, in our family, in our church, and in our country. Number one, this country, especially this capital, got in a mess because of the failure of leadership. You know, one old man said this years ago, and I think there's a lot of truth to this, Brother Randy, everything rises and falls on leadership. You think about that. That's a very powerful statement. So when leadership fails in the home, the home crumbles. When leadership fails in the church, the church crumbles. When leadership fails in Washington, then the whole country has to suffer. So watch what avenues of these people. You talking about discouraged, downhearted, ready to quit, sorry they even lived in Israel? The priest failed them and let them down. There was no evidence of any religious activity being held in order to pray that God would deliver them from the stress, from the siege they were in. Even though everything fell out, Church attendance was down. People didn't seek God like they did in days gone by. You remember in 1 Kings chapter number 6, I believe it is, when Samaria was set up and Ahab and Jezebel was the king of Samaria, the Bible says that Ahab set up a temple to the fake god Baal that Jezebel worshipped through the lineage of her mom and dad. So they had brought in paganistic worship into the country. People had gone so long without revival and the power of God in the church, they couldn't even distinguish what was real and what was fake. So they had turned over into paganism. And the priest would not cry out against it because they wanted to get along. They wanted everybody to meet under the umbrella of love. They didn't want to denounce that Baal was a pagan god. People would take their children and they would make a, a, an image to Baal, and they would set it on fire and throw their children into the fire and burn them alive and watch them die as a sacrifice. You think that somebody in the capital of that nation, you think they'd be one priest that would stand up and say, now wait a minute, that's straight out of hell. That's paganism, that's ungodly, that's anti-Bible. So I'm going to tell you why this country's in a mess. Because preachers want to meet under the umbrella of love. They will not address paganism. They will not preach against that which is ungodly. They're worried about a deacon board and a paycheck and their retirement. And they refuse to address the issues that need to be dealt with. So the priest had let them down. No wonder the country had fallen. Their parents had let them down. It's easy to sit back and criticize how sorry this generation is. And brother, it's probably one of the worst we're going to see if God doesn't do something. But could it be that the children are a product of what the parents have permitted? I think in some cases, some parents need to take the blame 
for this lackadaisy generation we have. Let me tell you why your boy's 23 years old and you don't want to get him to go to work. I'll tell you why. Because growing up, you let him watch cartoons all day while you cut the grass, while you did the weed eating, while you moved the rocks, while you painted the house, while you fixed the plumbing, while you changed the electrical. You let your kids lay in there, bless God, and watch purple Smurfs all day, and you never taught them anything in their life. They do not know how to work. If they broke a fingernail, they'd cry for three days. And I say to you, the reason why this generation is as sorry as it is, sometimes in some situations, the parents are to blame. You have ruined them. You have spoiled them. You defended them when they were wrong. You lied for them. You protected them. And that's why they're full of hell. That's why they're liars. That's why they're adulterers. That's why they're fornicators. Because you would not deal with them when you had them. You know that's good preaching. And I may get sued for this, but I'll get sued. I wouldn't have a dog that don't obey me when I call it. I'm not calling Junior ten times. I'm not telling him time out. I tell you what I do. I knock him out, bless God, what I do. And if you daddies will get your belt off and bust his bottom every once in a while, they'll shut up and learn how to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. They'll know how to do what you tell them to do the first time you tell them to do it. Can somebody say amen on that right now? I notice some of you men aren't clapping. It's not because you don't agree with me. It's because your wife don't agree with me. And if you clap while I'm preaching, you're going to the couch for 30 days, and that's why you're going to lose all your kids. You can't even control your wife, much less a kid. You're a good man, but your wife's out of control, and you know it, and I know it, and God knows it, and your kids are going to pay for it. Say, hey, man, hey, man. So the parents had let the country fall to pieces. The preachers had let the country fall all to pieces. And I hate to even get on this, but the politicians had let the country fall all to pieces. Now, I studied this. You know I want to be well studied because everything I say is investigated on television, and that's fine. I have fact checkers check me on everything. <laughs> Under the king's leadership, the nation had gone from being a nation of prosperity and peace to poverty and pain. Did you know when Joram was the king when this was happening, did you know he lifted the borders of Samaria for the first time and he started letting the Syrians come in past the border even though it was forbidden in the Jewish law. He had relieved all the borders and brought in all those pagans and all their pagan worship and brought them into the very capital of the nation of Israel. Because the Bible is very clear, a nation without borders is not a nation at all. Now, if I have to take time to say it, I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's a funny thing to me that we've sent $150 billion so Ukraine can keep their border, but we won't even send a police officer down to Mexico to make sure America... I'm saying to you, there's something wrong with politics when we'll defend everybody's border except ours. And you better wake up. The very crowd we're letting in is the very crowd that's going to take us over and destroy this country. Just like they did in the Bible days. Did you know this very day Syria is listed as the most dangerous country to visit in the world? You know why Joe Ram was such a wicked king? You know why he was so wicked? He was the son of Ahab. His daddy was a wicked king. His mother was a whore. You remember Jezebel? Had a tongue that reached from here to the back door. Slithered on both ends. Hated preaching. Started their own Bible college. You believe this bunch of nonsense. And so what had happened, the politics had continued to get corrupt because they passed it down from generation to generation. Can I say this? I am sick and tired of career politicians. We ought to have term limits where they can only serve so long that they need to get their tail.
career politicians have never done anything for this country. They sell out to the liberals. They sell out to the communists. They sell out to socialism. We ought to have two term limits just like the president. Then they need to go home and get a job like we have to get a job so they understand what it's like to put gas in your car and to put groceries on your table. I'll tell you something, if Joe Biden was paying $5 a gallon for gas, if he was paying 6 to $9 for a, gas, for a pound of bacon, I guarantee you things would be different. We ought to clean that crowd out, get somebody in there that loves God, believes in this country, and start all over again. That's why this midterm, don't just clap, get your tail to the voting booth and put every one of these stinking communistic, God-hating, America-hating liberals, put all of them on skid row and get them out of the capital of our country. So, they failed them in leadership. Second of all, Hurley, I want you to look at the famine in the land. Let me show you how bad this thing got, Brother Ricky. It got so bad when the country was sieged and the borders were broken and the politicians were corrupt and the preachers were silent. It was so bad that you could buy a donkey's head for $307 for a donkey's head. It was so bad that they were selling dove's dung for $19.18 a pint for dove's dung. It got so bad in that land, it almost makes me nauseated to talk about it, that two young mothers could sit down with two babies and come to the conclusion that they were so desperate and so hungry that they, here's what the Bible said, they didn't cook them, they boiled them. Can you imagine a mama taking her baby and making a coup with another mama? We will boil my baby today. Now, the fact, Brother Randy, that they said, we will boil yours tomorrow, leads me to believe that these babies had to be very young. They had to be very little. Because had they had any size to them, it would have lasted more than a day. But she said, we will eat mine today, and we will eat yours tomorrow. Could you imagine living in a land where a donkey's head, a, a, a stinking nasty donkey's head was $307? Can you imagine a pint of Dove's Dung being $19.18? Can you imagine going down the street and smelling the fumes of a boiling baby? And she said the next day, I said to the king, help me. And the king said, what aileth thee? She said, me and this woman. The other woman must have been with her when she addressed the king. She said, we made a pact to eat my son and hers tomorrow. And now she hid her son. It was so bad that lawlessness become accepted. Now listen, if you found out somebody bowled their baby and ate them, we'd call the cops and they'd be in jail and they ought to be in jail and they ought to spend the rest of their life in jail and they even probably ought to have capital punishment for somebody that's sick. But it was such lawlessness that when she said, we cooked and ate my baby, the king never even told the police, put her in jail. Why don't somebody put her in jail? Because law had fallen in the street and people were doing anything they wanted with anybody they wanted, and nobody was going to jail over it. Now, I'm your pastor, but I'm your friend. Get a gun. If you are legal to carry, get a gun. Because I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I am in the business world every day of my life. And part of that business world is a food chain. I'm not going to tell you everything I know, but I'm telling you, it is going to get to the point where people are going to start doing desperate things to feed their family. You men that have cattle, goats, livestock, you better make sure you got good fences. You better get cameras up. You better take care of it because these people are going to get so hungry, they're going to start going out in your field and butchering your livestock and cutting it in quarters right in your field and taking it home and feeding to their family. They're going to start carjacking you when you stop at a red light. You need to make sure your doors are locked. You need to have a pistol next to you. And if somebody puts their hand inside your car, shoot them! You ladies need to protect yourself. You need to take care of yourself. 
because there is definitely a famine in the land. Let me give you just a few simple illustrations. I was at a restaurant the other day, and the manager that I know came to me. He said, Preacher, can you believe it's so bad we can't sell onion, we can't sell onion rings at our restaurant anymore because there's a shortage on onions? Did you know because your grain is being raided and blowed up by the Russians, did you know 80% of our grain comes from Ukraine? Which means the price of bread and all that's going to skyrocket because there is no grain. Russia's burned all their fields up. I talked to a man at a grocery store the other day. He said by the end of the year, a dozen eggs will be $12 for a dozen eggs. I walked in my food city to give some money to people for groceries the other day. God told me to go up there and give a bunch of money away, and I did. And I stood there and watched people cry in, in the lines with their children, figuring on a calculator if they had enough money to buy the needs for their family with tears in their eyes. And God's blessed my wife and I, and we just paid for all their people's groceries as they came through. But I stood there, and I looked at a man standing at the formula shelves, and they were empty. And he looked at me, and he said, my son is not tolerant to milk. He said, there's only one kind of formula my son can drink. I've been to nine stores. My son's starving to death. He said, Preacher, how am I going to feed my baby? My son is starving. We're in the richest country in the world, and we got to ship in formula from another country. Somebody in Washington ought to be raising hell knee deep that we can't even feed our babies. Medications are getting hard to come by. China has made every antibiotic that's ever come to the United States since 2008. There was a blood pressure medicine used by millions of people across the country. Some of you here were using that medicine, and I spoke to you. And from out of nowhere, all of a sudden, everybody that I knew that took this certain blood pressure medicine began to have side effects. Everybody that took it that I knew. They came to me. Preacher, what do I do? This is making me sick. I don't feel good. Why is this affecting me? I've been taking it for years. I did a study. That medicine comes from China. How do we know we're not they're not changing these medications? How do you know they're not putting stuff in medications that's going to screw you up, give you Alzheimer's, make you have a heart attack? How do we know they're not putting stuff in medicine that's making boys want to be girls and girls want to be boys? There's something that has saturated this generation to make them unhappy with their sexuality like this country has never known. I promise you, somewhere through a vaccine, somewhere through a medication, somewhere through a medical field, this generation is being affected. I'm not trying to make you paranoid. I'm trying to give you wisdom and understand it. When you go to take your kid to get a vaccination, do not let them give that kid nine shots at one time. You can't put nine germs in a baby's body and it not affect them. Autism is at an all-time high. One in five children, one in five children in this generation has some former stage of autism. That wasn't even thought about when I was a kid just a generation ago. Somewhere, something is infatuating and getting planted into the bodies of these children. I believe with all of my heart, some of these vaccinations, when you give them to them, I'm not anti-vaccination, but when you give them to them in such a quantity, it's killing the testosterone in these men. So instead of boys wanting to climb trees, they're wanting to paint their fingernails. Instead of playing with Tonka toys, they want to put high heel shoes on. I tell you, there's something wrong with this generation, and you better wake up and claim responsibility for your kids, and you better do what's best for them concerning their health and concerning their education. I'm not sending my kid to a school system where drag queens walk down the aisle and hold the hands of little boys and girls and stupid parents allow them to do that with their kids. There's nothing wrong with a kid, but there's something bad wrong with that parent. Every business I go to that I know, and I know many, many businessmen, everyone I'm going to come to me saying, do you know anybody that'll work? Can you people help me because I'm uneducated with this generation? How are you paying your bills? You lazy suckers. Who in the name of heaven is paying your electric bill, your water bill, your rent, your food bill, the gas in your eye? Where in the world? You mean to tell me this country's so far gone that we are paying people to be stupid and lazy 
Our education system has fallen all to pieces. People don't even want to go to college anymore. They have no ambition to own their own home, buy a piece of property, and own their car. All they want to do is lay on the couch, make babies like a bunch of rabbits, get $1,500 a buck, a buck for each kid, and never hit a lick at a snake. You can't keep a generation alive if somebody doesn't go to work. Somebody's got to go to work. There's a famine of workers everywhere. You know, everywhere I go up until this famine, let's use that word. When I pull in the gas station, Brother Simmerly, everybody pulls in the gas station with me. You know, there's pumps everywhere. You watch people. They put their credit card in, fill their car up. I've been watching that for years. They're not doing it now. They're not doing it anymore. I went to a gas pump the other day and I told my wife, I said, I want you to watch this. People are going up to the windows. $10, please. Brother Corey, that's two gallons of gas. You mean I got a guy trying to feed a family, keep food on the table and a roof over their head and gas in a car, and he can put in 10 bucks at a time? Shame on a nation. Shame on a nation that'll bring in a bunch of illegals and give them $4,500 a month and give them free education and free hospitalization and free eye care. It's got them about ready to preach now, buddy. Then you take a hard-working man that's trying to keep food on the table and he's putting $10 at a time in his gas tank. I say shame on this country. Shame on this administration. You Republicans and Democrats, all of you need run out of office. You're all a bunch of compromisers. You're all two-faced. You're all sorry and lazy. You're a bunch of sissies. That's the famine in the land. Now, I want to talk about the favor of the Lord, and I'm done. So everything's in a mess. Syria has brought all their chariots, all their horses. Now, Brother Randy, we're, we're talking 100,000 people. And they've surrounded Samaria. Now, watch this. God lets this thing fall all to pieces. He lets the country fall all to pieces, Brother Charles. He lets the churches fall all to pieces. He lets the politicians. He lets the homes go down to absolutely nothing. And now they're starving on top of all of that. They can't eat anything. And all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, that same preacher that the king wanted to kill, he sent a messenger to Elijah. and said, hey, man, uh, say something good. We ain't a mess up here. Now, a week ago, he wanted to cut his head off. Now that everything's falling apart, he realizes, if we're going to get help, I've got to find somebody that knows God. This world don't know it, but we're the best friends they got because we know how to get a hold of God. They don't know that yet. They will. So Elijah says this. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to prophesy something. In 24 hours, a half bushel of fine upgrade flour, a half bushel, I'm going to sell it for $3.84. That's 120 times cheaper than the dove's dung you're eating. He said, in 24 hours, I'm going to sell you two-thirds of a bushel of barley for $3.84. That's 240 times cheaper than the dove's dung you're eating off the floor. And one of the officers, of the governors of the king said, if God would open up the windows of heaven, that ain't never going to happen. Even God can't do that. And Elijah said, I'll tell you what you've done. You've cursed yourself. God's going to let you see it, but you're never going to be a partaker of it. I'd hate to know I had to watch others being blessed while I couldn't be blessed because I didn't believe God couldn't do something in my life. So, so here's the favor of God. You can't stop the favor of God. So all of a sudden, there's four lepers outside the city of Samaria. You remember lepers were considered unclean. They had to live outside the city. And if anybody come around them, they had to cup their hands over their mouth and yell unclean. They wasn't, around, they wasn't allowed to be around anybody. So four of them got together and said, look, man, we dying of leprosy, but I don't want to die hungry. So here's what I want to do. Let's go turn ourselves into the Syrians. No need to go to Samaria. They're as hungry as we are. So let's go to the Syrians and just turn ourselves in. And if they kill us, we're dying anyway. But they may give us something to eat, which would be awesome. You're going to understand there's enough food and supplies there for 100,000 troops plus. Four lepers start walking to the Syrian camp 
And God magnified the sound of them walking. And the Syrians were sitting outside their tents. And one of them said, oh no, I hear that. That's a great army of people. They're surrounding us. It was four lepers starving to death. But I tell you, God can magnify anybody anytime he wants to under any situation. Now only God can do this. Watch this, Brother Nick. Four starving to death, cancer-eating up lepers walk into the camp of the Syrians. They didn't grab their swords. They didn't grab their horses. They didn't take their tent. They said, we're surrounded. Run for your life. And they all took off running down toward Dothan and left that whole camp. Them four lepers, one of them went inside a tent and he came out and he had a bucket in his hand. He said, chicken, boys, chicken. We got chicken. <laughs> Another one came out with a Big Mac, glory to God. Said, we got Big Macs, fish sandwiches, and double-deckers. Another one come out and said, we got ice cream. And while they were sitting there eating, brother boy, one of the lepers said to the other three, this ain't right. Look at all this food. We need to take it back and give it to the people of Samaria. Let's be good to the people that were not good to us. Let's be good to the people that threw us out and said we wasn't good enough. Instead of being bitter and mean, let's go back and be a blessing. And brother, they went running up to the gate of the city and the king looked over the gate and said, you bunch of lepers, get out of here. We don't have anything to do with you. He said, KFC chicken, McDonald's hamburgers, Dairy Queen Sundays. And the king said, open the gate, open the gate, open the gate. And they brought food in, and revival broke out, and the cellars were filled, and food was everywhere, and people prospered, and the power of God fell, and the peace of God fell. You know what I'm telling you? Let it get as bad as it's got to get. There's a God in heaven that favors his children. And when it looks like there is no way, God is going to make a way. So he gets all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Let's give the Lord a hand in his house today. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Good to have you in the house of God today. What an honor to be able to preach to such a beautiful crowd of people. You are no doubt the best people in the world. That's why I'm humbled and honored to be called your pastor. And again, thank you for being here.